if I ran a Nintendo today, I'd probably put out 5,000 pieces of creative content starring Zelda and Mario and build up the IP and make sure all those characters and all those visions would be winning on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. I would just produce at scale. This has now become singularly a making game. Make, 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 make. You got your perspective. I just wanna be happy, don't you wanna be happy? If you were to give a percentage of your work life, home life balance, what would it be? Do you think the balance is important to being successful in your overall day to day? Yes, um, but I also think that balance ebbs and flows. So I'm probably spending more time on my life right now than ever. Um, I mean look, I, it all, people look at things funny. Between, two, between being fully all in on weekends, between five other weeks of vacation during the year, like you're already at a place where you're talking about you only work 225 of the 360, you know, like, you know, like people are very funny about how they think about work-life balance. Like I think that for me, somebody who enjoys work, um, between those vacations and weekends, and now my kids are getting older, so now it is go to a soccer match in the middle of the day, which is super foreign to me. Like I used to be 9 a.m., midnight, every minute, boom. So, but again, I think it's similar to not judging myself that somebody's upset this morning. Like you can only do your best. And I think one of the biggest weaknesses in our society is that people beat themselves up at every single second instead of looking at it in a year's worth or a life's work or at least a month's work. And so I think balance is important. I also think everybody here has different balance. Some people think nine to five is balance. I would hate my life if I worked nine to five. It's just too much downtime for me. I enjoy what I do too much. So you get to define balance. You get to judge yourself. And people literally take the opinions of their parents and friends into how they parent or work life balance. That is so laughable. Too much peer pressure. Too much judgment. All right, so in terms of where you see advertising, and and maybe not even just digital, where where would you see advertising going in five, 10 years? I have no idea. Um, A hypothesis I have definitely is voice is gonna be a player. I definitely believe that the new interface that's brewing is voice and its impact will be as large as the mobile device when at scale 15, 17 years from now. I'm not, pat, you know, I get a lot of credit because of the way I invested in all the documentation of being right a lot, but what I try to remind people is when I was saying those things, it had already happened. I'm not predicting TikTok, it has 1.5 billion downloads. The fuck kind of guess is that? <laughs> it's just that people love to say no about today, let alone the future. I'm not worried about AR, blockchain, you know, ML, you know, VR, all of it's coming. I'm watching all of it. But no real people use it yet. And so people love to jump the gun on technology advancements ahead of the consumer behavior. I am blindly a day trader of this second. Before I worry about how to get, you know, my AR capabilities down, why not maximize the shit out of today, right this second? You know, LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, grossly underpriced. And advertising's always been the leading edge of, you know, culture. So AR has to, and VR has to begin to weave its way in. And as advertising agencies, do we have to be at the forefront? In a practical way. The reason I've been able to do that is because I'm willing to make less money. You know, not super complicated. Back to CFO, CFO walks in and says, I want to shut down the voice department. I'm like, and shut down the whole company. He's like, but it's not profitable. I'm like, I'm aware. That's the punchline. The reason most agencies aren't able to pull it off is because they don't want to give up the margin that year. Mm-hmm. You're not gonna have clients often pay to subsidize you know, those new advancements. But I think the key is to not be too far in advance. So we do have people flirting with AR and VR and things of that nature, but it is flirting because it's just not close. I don't think people realize how not close VR is. I don't know a single person that knows a single person 
that spends an hour a day in a VR environment. Every person spends seven hours a day in a phone. Talk about a real delta. So, yeah. To me, it's the speed in adjusting to what the consumer's done. What I'm proud of is, as soon as Musical.ly gets bought by TikTok, they relaunch, stuff starts happening. Our ability at Vayner to be a creative on that department, in that world, within moments of it becoming real, yeah. that's the strength more than predicting. It's the speed in which you can execute in today versus the variable of being right about tomorrow. We talked a little bit um, uh, in, before the uh, live stream started about how you've scaled uh, your company. And you know, just from, from a cultural standpoint, but also from a, a process standpoint, from a, an accountability standpoint. Could you speak to that, that a little bit? Yeah, it's a, it's a human game. You know, you know, from a cultural standpoint, from a process standpoint, it's just judging the judgers you know, at my level, I think. I think people are very naive on how much the variable of success is predicated on the CEO. You know, like she or he has a whole lot of say. They're the judge and the jury. A CEO is basically the Supreme Court. You know, like it's pretty final. These are dictatorships. You know, obviously there's boards in some companies that may have a little juice, but the reality is is that, you know, the way we've done it is by actually caring about it. You know, it's not super complicated. I would, I, we're far more advanced on culture than process. I hate process so much that I don't look at it often. And anytime I do look at it, it looks like it's going really poorly. And so then I just cry and go to sleep. <laughs> and so, um, you know. You have a chief heart, heart officer. We you do. You have a chief process officer. We don't. And, and I think that there's a couple reasons. Uh, I, and we won't. I believe that human beings that work in companies are disproportionately obsessed with process. And I think the second you start putting the process in front of the output, you lose. And I think almost every company puts the process in front of the output. I'd rather the process be murky and breakable than put on a pedestal. It's a tricky one. It is. It's a tricky one. But if you listen to what I just said, what you'll learn is it will come down to casting. And if you work on culture and people aren't political with each other, and jerks, they'll figure it out much easier and with less friction. But the reality is most agencies have too much process and way too much insecurity in politics and thus it's slow and clunky and crappy. Do you think that data privacy regulations are ready to handle like a world in which everything is the same too? So I think, I think I'll answer the second one first. It's about data privacy regulations can handle a world where AI, where every single product is smart at scale two decades from now, which is the assumption or guess that I have right now. Uh, No, but I think there's a much bigger conversation around data privacy that's not being had, which is I actually don't think people care about the privacy. I, I think there's a much more thoughtful conversation going on that will eventually play out, which is I'm gonna I'm gonna predict that it's gonna go the other way. I would prefer that every technology knew everything about me. I mean it, unless you kill my children or steal my money, I'd prefer you know everything. This notion of privacy, what privacy were we actually talking about? What websites I went on? My credit card number? You give away your credit card number every day, everywhere. Like Target and the IRS had much bigger breaches than Facebook. Um, You know, like I think there's this fun narrative right now to demonize technology because we don't like being accountable. Like, the Russians didn't make you vote for someone. You did. You decided to believe, you know, and so this huge lack of accountability will play out. So I'm not, I, you know, look, if somebody is creeped out that their refrigerator reordered their milk because the milk spoke to the refrigerator and it said we have one pour left, they're more than welcome to not. I keep reminding people, I'm like, don't have a smartphone. Gary, this all sucks, it's all terrible. I'm like, delete Facebook. I did. I'm like, but you're on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, but I like it. <laughs> I mean, so, look, I think as an agency, when you think about the smartification, you're talking about building. You're talking about actually being in dev, which is not a big passion of mine, ironically. I don't like building the highways. I like driving them better than anybody else. So, I think when you talk about smartification, where it's all gonna lead to is brand. Brand is gonna become the most important thing because when you're ordering on a voice device, you better say Kleenex, not 
tissues. You better say Nike, not sneakers, because then Amazon or Google are gonna pick for you, right? Same thing with brand. Once I put that Pepsi in that fridge, that fridge is reordering Pepsi, not me deciding to pick up Coke at an end cap at Walmart. So brand is, I, I can't yell about it enough. Like look at my own behaviors. The signature, the sonic branding, like this is all branding for me. You know, like all my friends call me a sucker for giving away the 270 page deck the other day. Not me, I think about brand. You feel warmer towards me, I did something nice for you. People don't get it. So that's how I see, you know, I think privacy is really funny. Like, I think Europe is a really miss, is really misplaying the world. I think Europe's irre- growing irrelevance has a lot to do with the defense they have around all this stuff. When Google and Facebook and all these other companies don't want to be there, um, that's going to be bad, not good. Um, how do you, you're obviously putting out a lot of content over so many different platforms. So my question is, how do you measure the success of that? Is it based on purely likes and as we start to see likes going away? Well, likes will go away only for our insecurities outward, but we will still see them on the back end. But keep going. Yeah, so I'm is that- wondering what is um, your way of measuring? My, my, measure, my measurement on success is far more qualitative because I'm trying to win on brand. I'm not trying to sell K-Swiss sneakers. I know that I sold a thousand pairs yesterday on this singular Instagram post, but that is not where my mind goes on is that good or bad. My mind works this way. When I went to the airport last week and a seven-year-old ran up to me and asked for a selfie, I knew TikTok was working. So for me, it's qualitative. I know something's working based on reading the comments at scale. Um, So for me, it's much more the comments themselves, not how many comments, the interpretation of the intent of the, of the comments, because I'm building brand. I'm not worried about how many likes and shares it gets. So I know that Facebook have been like testing search ads um, you know, quite recently. I think it was rolled out uh, last month to advertisers. So I was wondering, do you envision a day where like for local advertisers that Facebook becomes a viable search option as opposed to like Google and Bing? I thought so years ago. But much like I knew Google Plus wasn't gonna work because it wasn't in Google's DNA, I, Facebook has not shown to me that search is inherently in their collective DNA. I'm shocked that Facebook is not a bigger search player given the scale that they had, given how great the data could have been. Um, not as confident as I used to be, but that's what's great about everything. You can reboot anything. They could hire one great executive from Google and she could drive it. I, there's a whole lot of interesting data that I'd love to search that's public in Facebook from a search engine standpoint. So, um, but I do think certain companies have certain DNAs. You know? Mm-hmm. I've actually got another question. Please. Yeah. <laughs> so this is like, I know what we talked about earlier. Uh, and you kind of did answer it, but Google just released their like cloud gaming platform, yep. Google Stadium. Yep. Do you envision like basically within the next decade we're now seeing like gaming ads by like offered by Google? Yes. Google will absolutely go into dynamic gaming ads. They just need to have the control of the inventory. So they've got to win the IP game because if they have to go through Blizzard or somewhere else, they've got a problem. Whoever owns the IP wins that game, right? Otherwise, they're gonna have to pay a huge vig to the game creator to get in there. And then by nature, the ad won't be inherently native because there'll be a friction between two different companies, almost like creative and media. So I think Google, but I think what people forget is how big these companies are. Like Google can buy one of the top gaming studios in the world. But yes, I do. Gaming is, People are extremely naive about where gaming is in our society. Like eSports is easily one of the top three sports in America in 15 years with basketball and soccer being the other two that have the most upside. Whereas football is stagnant, even though it's America's passion and hockey and baseball continue to decline. I mean, the five best baseball players in America could walk into this office right now and 95% of this audience would not know who they are. They'd be like, those are some good looking buff dudes. <laughs> but they wouldn't know that it's Mike Trout. 
and he's the best player. The best. And when you're in a place where the, disp- by the way, not only is Mike Trout the best player in baseball, he's probably gonna go down as one of the best players of all time. And the fact that half the audience doesn't even know who that is, is a real big problem for baseball. And that, by the way, this is a good lesson for digital agencies and marketers and business people, that's because baseball took the stance a decade ago that they would create an organization called BAM and they would monetize every piece of content, thus every free piece of content on YouTube and social media was taken down by Major League Baseball. Plus baseball teams couldn't do their own stuff, nor could players. It was all controlled at a central level to monetize. They made a lot of money in the short term, but they completely killed the brand of the sport. Along the lines of uh, con- controlling the IP, I know that you had mentioned Nintendo and them finally kind of getting into the app game. If yes. you ran Nintendo, what would be your next move to win that game? If I ran a Nintendo today, I'd probably put out 5,000 pieces of creative content starring Zelda and Mario and build up the IP and make sure all those characters and all those visions would be winning on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. You have to make sure that Kid Icarus and you know, Mega Man and all these things reboot all that nostalgia brands, not just Mario and Zelda. Um, and then I would innovate for games within the environments of streaming. Like, you know, like there's no reason that Fortnite couldn't have been predicated on Nintendo characters. So I would look at multiplayer, you know, streaming games, and I would look at mobile games very heavily for females because the IP translates extremely well to the female de- demo. Um, and uh, I would just be contemporary. I'd probably start 10 original podcasts. I would just produce at scale. This has now become singularly a making game. Make, 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 make. Right. I think our uh, final question we have from uh, one of the live streamers, uh, Ed from SAI Digital, is what would be the biggest impact 5G will make in digital marketing out of the gate in five years ahead? Ed, is it? Ed, I'm not really sure. The one thing that I really know about 5G, so I think it's funny how people think about 5G. Most people, if they're even aware of it, are like, cool, my phone will be faster. (laughs) Meanwhile, this is a transcending technology. Um, 5G will be the reason that autonomous cars become real because the lag time will be zero. Uh, 5G is the reason that a surgeon could be woken up in Brazil tonight because she's the best in the world at a certain surgery and she can VR with 5G performing surgery on you while you're in New Jersey. That's amazing. So the speed in which information moves is so incredible. I don't remember the exact fact, but this is not like from four to five. This is like from four to 40 or four to 400. I don't remember if it's 10X or 100, but it's profound. So I I think that the ability for information to move with no lag is what is really going to be profound. Things like the, you know, when you start thinking about technology where the paint is smart. Some of the things we talked about with the refrigerator and things of that nature are predicated on 5G. Think about a world where our pavement outside is smart and because of 5G can speak to our car and your car actually slightly moves so you don't hit the puddle going 72 on the turnpike which mathematically would have meant you would have lost control enough and predicated on where all the other cars were positioned to you, it avoided an accident for you. That's crazy ass shit. 5G.